the students understand that if they want to be here, if they want to be on campus, that uh, everybody has to do their, their part. We all have to be looking out for one another, and that goes for every member of our community, including our students. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we're talking about the future of education and how universities plan to cope with coronavirus. President of Stanford University, Mark Tessier Levine, is here to discuss. Just off a winding road west of the Andes in Chile is a wealthy enclave known as Vitacura. It's Santiago's most affluent neighborhood. In fact, they call it Sanhattan. Isn't that cute? A two bedroom here will run you just under a million. If you're raising a family, good chance you're sending them to one of its elite private schools. Unlike Manhattan, it's not accessible by metro. It's not crowded. Not the sort of place you'd expect for a major outbreak. And yet, that's exactly what happened. Why am I talking about this? Well, Chile's first documented super spreader event of the coronavirus pandemic occurred at the Vitacura Private School back in March. And the key takeaway, 40% of infected students were asymptomatic. They contributed to a fast moving contagion that would soon grip the entire country. Now, as schools reopen across the globe, Vitacura has become an important case study in just how easily and silently children can transmit the disease. Taken together with data collected by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in both the United States and China, there is growing evidence to suggest that kids are just as likely to spread the virus as adults, even though the symptoms are usually more mild. Babies and toddlers may be the exception when it comes to symptoms. But remember, this is a novel coronavirus, novel meaning new. While scientists race toward a vaccine, researchers are struggling to offer lasting guidance. And so parents and school administrators are left to piece together information about the safety of their schools. Countries like Norway and Denmark have authorities sending young students back in late spring without a significant rise in caseload. Their use of masks, limited class size, and social distancing were all enforced. But that same study cautioned against drawing too many conclusions, citing a lack of data. Meanwhile, in places like Israel, you've seen the dangers of moving too fast. Just two weeks after reopening, major new outbreaks prompted Israeli authorities to close dozens of schools. In South Korea, among the world's few coronavirus success stories, authorities shuttered schools amid threats of a resurgence. Others like Japan have moved forward, allowing some primary and secondary students to return with mandatory face masks and daily temperature checks. But what about universities? 20 million college students are staring down uncertainty about campus life as the semester gets underway. In Alabama, despite masks and social distancing, University of Alabama President Stuart Bell had this to say just five days after reopening his school when more than 500 new coronavirus cases emerged. Although our initial reentry test was encouraging, the rise in COVID cases that we've seen in recent days is unacceptable and if unchecked, threatens our ability to complete the semester on campus. Remember, this is an economic story as much as it is a health story. Empty dorms, vacant sports stadiums, real questions about endowments and those paying full tuition. University coffers have for decades relied on full price students from overseas. Chinese students account for roughly one third of all money spent by international students in the US. Lockdowns and travel restrictions are squeezing that revenue, not to mention the challenges in US-China relations. Smaller schools may be forced to close, others forced to invest big in technology. Education tech expenditures are forecast to swell by 12% this year and next, reaching 325 billion by the year 2025. Zoom is just the beginning. And that could be the silver lining in all this, a long overdue tech-inspired disruption challenging conventional wisdom about education at a time when the future of schools is uncertain. Stanford University President Mark Tessier-Levine, wonderful to be with you, sir. It's wonderful to be here too, Ian. Thanks very much for having me on your show. You, you changed course uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago. There was an intention to let freshmen and sophomores, I guess, come to campus. 
um, and that is no longer uh, the case. How, how did you weigh that decision? Yes, yeah, no, it was a, a very difficult decision, very disappointing. Our students wanted to come back. Our faculty wanted to come back. There are really three major considerations uh, that went into the decision. Uh, the first is you know, the, the course of the disease locally within our community. Um, the second is uh, the nature of the, the housing for our undergraduate students. And the third is uh, uh, local and state uh, health guidance. So back in early June, uh, when cases were dropping, uh, working with our experts, we thought that we could handle having two class cohorts come back, freshmen and sophomores. Uh, we couldn't have all of them. We needed to de-densify the dorms. Our, our students live in communal dormitories where it's difficult to control disease. Uh, so we needed to de-densify and also maintain hundreds of beds for quarantine and isolation. But that we thought could work uh, given the state of the disease back in June. Dial forward two months, you know, what a difference two months make. The fifth largest economy in the world grinding to a halt again. The state now averaging 8,000 new cases a day, more than double just a month ago. And the resurgence of cases, uh, both locally and nationally, uh, made us concerned about being able to manage the health consequences of bringing the students back. But just as important, the state uh, guidance that came out in, in mid-August, uh, we think appropriately uh, banned gatherings, um, the use of common rooms and dorms, uh, the, uh, any in-person lectures in counties like ours that are on a watch list. And so what we saw is that the, if we brought students back, their, their experience would be so impoverished. Uh, so the, it was really the combination of the two things, the health concerns and the fact that we couldn't deliver a good experience that made us change course and decide to go online for our undergraduates. When you do uh, get back to students coming to campus, what kind of infrastructure do you think is required? Uh, I mean, for example, you know, how, how regular would testing have to be for the entire campus population? So in fact, we have invited back all of our graduate students, those who want to come back. We expect to have about 6,000 students on campus this fall. So it isn't a question of, of when we have students coming back. We will have students coming back. Uh, of course, we look forward to having our undergraduates come back uh, as well. So in terms of the precautions that you talk about, Absolutely, we will do um, significant testing uh, on arrival when students arrive on day one and then again on day five uh, with appropriate follow-up um, for exposure notification and isolation and quarantine of any individuals uh, who have COVID. Then ongoing surveillance testing. I should, of course, say we're, we have to do all the other things uh, that you might expect, uh, have protocols for uh, social distancing, wearing face masks, uh, regular hand washing, and also uh, de-densifying buildings. If we look at our laboratories where our, our students and researchers go to do laboratory research, we've had to de-densify them. They work in shifts so that we only have one student per 250 square feet. There's unidirectional circulation through the building. All the things you need to do um, to, to really try to uh, mitigate the risk of spread of disease. Uh, on the on the building front and the circulation uh, of air, are, are there are there new protocols, new pieces of equipment uh, that you've been able to put in that actually make being inside more safe for people? Yeah, so the uh, uh, absolutely there's there's a lot of concern about recirculating um, air. Our experts uh, believe that with the kind of air circulation that we have and the kind of density protocols that we have, that we are maintaining a high level of safety. I think as buildings are built in the future, I think this is going to be a major focus of engineers and building constructors to, to make sure that should something like this happen again, buildings not just on a university campus like ours that are relatively sparse and, and open, uh, but in, in much higher density are safe as well. So much of America's uh, comparative failings in coronavirus has been about uh, willingness of a large-scale population to take on uh, these behaviors, whether it's social distancing, uh, whether it's avoiding large groups, uh, whether it's mask wearing. How do you go about enforcement of those requirements? Are these honor code violations if you find that some students are not behaving in that way? What do you do? Well, uh, you're absolutely right, Ian. We all have to be in this together. Uh, we all have to be looking out for one another, and that goes for every member of our community, including our students. We have protocols in place. There are state regulations. 
Um, we, uh, every day uh, when uh, I come to campus or others come to campus, I have to sign in with a health, health app. We've asked our students who live on campus to, to sign a compact uh, agreeing to abide by, by uh, university uh, and state rules. Obviously, the major focus is on education. Uh, and engaging the students. The students understand that if they want to be here, if they want to be on campus, that uh, everybody has to do their, their part. Uh, I'm very proud of our students. Uh, I believe that they come in uh, wanting to uh, take all the appropriate steps. If there are uh, any transgressions, our, our first focus is education, Ian. You know, reminding people, uh, you know, appealing to uh, the, the better angels of their nature. You know, if we see gross violations, uh, large parties, for example, then we do actually have to take steps. I mean, there's no question. We're working with our graduate students right now on defining what those steps would be. I think it's something we have to do in partnership with our students to define this, but the students have to be, um, uh, have skin in the game. They have to be participants in this. Otherwise, it's not going to be successful. And everybody wants this to be successful. When we get God willing, um, to a vaccine that is FDA approved, that has some efficacy, and you know we want to get Stanford students all back to campus. Can you envisage a situation where it would be mandatory for students to have to take that vaccine if they want to come back? Uh, that's a, a great question, Ian. It's one that we are uh, we are looking at right now with uh, our, our health authorities, with um, our bioethicists on on campus as well. We know that uh, most of our students, our faculty, our staff will avail themselves of that. Um, whether it should be mandatory is a, is a question that I think is going to be a very important one to, to address in coming months. How's the learning experience going to be for all of these undergraduate students uh, that can't be on campus? What percentage are, are going to actually participate to the extent that you know at this point? Um, and, uh, and how are you going to engage with them? So we've certainly given the option to students um, to take a gap year um, if, if they want, and, and uh, many students have availed themselves of that opportunity, but we, we will have a large cohort of students uh, in all years uh, taking courses uh, in the fall semester for our undergraduates, again, uh, uh, fully online. There are highs and lows of online learning. Um, maybe I can start with some of the the, the positives, it's possible with, with online learning, uh, with Zoom, uh, for example, uh, to make uh, more use of uh, active learning tools. For example, the Socratic method of calling on students. Uh, it's much easier to do that if you can see their names on the screen. Um, it's easier for, for students often to break out into small groups, something that uh, many of our faculty like to use. Uh, unless a room is set up for people to be able to move their chairs around, that, that can be difficult in a standard lecture theater. Much easier, in fact, uh, online. It's easier to have uh, outside speakers come in and fly in for a, a, a 10 minute cameo and talk about something. So those are all positives. You know, on the negative side, it can be very wearing, wearing to the students, wearing to the faculty. It's, uh, of course, highlights inequities. Uh, people's living arrangements make a big difference. If you live with uh, many family members in a small house where it's difficult to have privacy, that can be very difficult. If you don't have good internet access, that can be very difficult. Uh, so I think we see an exacerbation of the inequities uh, that are present in our country in the context uh, of learning as well. I wonder, as you look forward, um, ha what's your sort of back of the envelope thinking of uh, when Stanford gets back to status quo ante. The, the view has to be conditioned by when we think a vaccine will be available. I think we, we all know there are many treatments uh, that are, are being tested uh, in clinical trials right now and, and developed, uh, including some that, that have been developed here at, at Stanford. We're eager to see those treatments that can reduce the severity of the disease for those who have it. And, and there are already some that have shown um, uh, efficacy, remdesivir, uh, dexamethasone, uh, you know, have, have shown a benefit in certain settings for certain uh, patients in reducing the severity of the disease. So it's hard for us to predict. I, I don't really want to make uh, predictions or detailed predictions. Certainly, I, I would hope and expect that next year will be very different from this year, that we'll be back to some semblance of normal. When in the spring or in the winter um, we will be at that stage, I don't know. We are, we are planning for the disease being here, and what we want to do is put in place protocols uh, that will enable us to get on with our work, get on with education, get on with in-person learning, uh, even if we don't yet have a vaccine. So that's where a lot of our focus uh, is. Uh, right now. The other thing I should say, you say, when will we get back to the status quo ante? 
I think the university is going to be changed by this. I, I don't think we're going back to the status quo ante. And, and maybe I can, can point out two areas. Um, Please. That's the, the, the case. The first, this, this huge experiment, forced experiment in, in online learning and online work, as difficult as it's been for all of us, um, has also shown uh, tremendous promise in certain areas. Take telehealth. Back in January and February at our, the Stanford uh, Healthcare, we have a, a big hospital here, uh, we had uh, each month about 3,000 telehealth consults. Today, we have three to 5,000 every day. Every day, three to 5,000 uh, consults. Now, when we go back to a new normal and, and people are coming to the hospital, that will reduce. But I've talked to our physicians. The expectation is that maybe we'll have at least half as many. So many, many more than before. As we've learned how to do it, as we've seen how effective it can be, it's much less of a burden on individuals who would have to travel to the hospital, wait, sometimes potentially exposing themselves to, to disease and so forth. So it can be a great benefit. Do you, do you worry... Um, on the other side of that, as not just Stanford, but every university around the world has to figure out how to make online and hybrid learning really work, that the incredible expense uh, attached to the in-person Stanford experience is going to be harder to maintain that advantage, that attraction um, for a lot of people around the world? Ten years ago, when uh, the first wave of online learning happened, the MOOCs, um, uh, you know, massive uh, open online uh, content, people thought that this was, uh, I think the quote was, it's a tsunami that's going to wash away a higher education. And quite the contrary, the, what it's done is it's created very valuable tools, both for those who come to campus and for those who can't come to campus. But it hasn't lessened the interest in the in the in-person experience because students get much more um, uh, through the connection with their their fellow students, through the uh, personal interactions uh, with faculty that that's more difficult to deliver if you're uh, reaching out to thousands upon thousands of students as opposed to um, a smaller number of students, whether it's in person or online, uh, I might add. So uh, I do think that um, uh, there will uh, continue to be a strong demand for the kind of education uh, that Stanford um, can uh, deliver. So Mark, I mean, I, I think one thing I'd like to uh, get to uh, before we close the interview is um, the opportunities that are created by crisis. And I, I'm wondering um, where you see the biggest uh, ways forward, not just at Stanford, but for higher education um, in the United States, uh, which has been criticized in many ways for crushing student debt, uh, it's been criticized for not being as competitive in many cases um, as it has been historically. I would point to the focus on online education and the ability to reach out to many more students. Um, uh, I think that there will be a democratization of, uh, of higher education that will occur through that, um, through the ways that we, we discussed uh, of universities like ours, both uh, developing content for other students, but also reaching out um, to other populations. That's a, a first element uh, of, of the equation in terms of the impact of higher education on our, our community as a whole. I do think the, the issues of uh, access um, and affordability are very, very uh, important um, as well. Uh, the, at Stanford, our approach uh, has been to provide deep financial aid. Uh, currently, families, uh, students from families earning less than $150,000 a year get free tuition. Uh, those from families earning less than $65,000 a year get free tuition, fees, and room and board. 82% of our students graduate without any student debt whatsoever. So it, it's a model that we're going to continue to push internally, even as we develop tools to try to um, uh, help students who don't have the benefit of, of coming to Stanford. Mark Tessier Levine, President of Stanford University, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Ian. It's been great to be here. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, stick around, right? We're virtual. We've got a campus. Everyone's welcome. Take a minute and sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal.